Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. A voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ and the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition. Well, we're delighted today uh, to speak to our friend, uh, independent journalist, author, commentator, filmmaker, founder of The Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal. Max, welcome. Thanks, Michael. It's an honor and pleasure to be back with you. Yeah, it's always good to have you here, Max. Uh, uh, we consider you uh, a, a dear friend here in Fort Wayne, so thanks for joining us. Uh, you, you've been here in Fort Wayne. We've interviewed you before uh, uh, last summer, yet so much has uh, happened since then. I, I know many of your friends attending today want to know how you and Anya uh, are doing during the COVID quarantine. Well, we're probably doing a lot better than people who don't have the privilege to work at home, who are part of the kind of professional class that really embraces these lockdown policies. Um, I think pe the people we refer to as frontline workers are getting COVID at much higher rates. We live in Ward 8 in Washington, D.C., which is one of the poorest in the city. It is majority Black really ref a reflection of what much of DC used to be like before the city was hevified. And this uh, ward has the highest death rate and it has the one of the highest COVID rates. And that's not because people are, it's because they have to go out and do the work of delivering food and packages, the Amazon trucks that um, other people like us don't really have to do. And we get to talk about that experience and they're not really getting any much relief. So, you know, I think about all the people who are nuts and pans for the frontline workers, even though there's no one like in, you see it in these scenes in New York city, but there are, or, or hospital workers, even though there are no met street and, you know, all of these tributes by big corporations, workers, but that sort of displaces our responsibility for actually campaigning for something like Medicare for all that would actually relieve people's conditions and so many people around living off of unemployment benefits that are not enough. We'll see how the new Biden administration does in increasing those benefits while negotiating with Republicans who have no interest in doing it. But we're doing fine. And we've also had the chance to travel to Bolivia and Venezuela to observe elections in those countries that were extremely contentious and, uh, you know, looking forward to talking about that. I'm going to ask you about Venezuela in a little bit. Uh, so um, uh, hold your fire on that one. But yeah. uh, um, uh, I know that our folks and I, we too here uh, want to hear about uh, um, what's been going on in the nation's capital in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, um, let, let me ask you, um, what can you add what can you add to what we know from the press about the assault on the Capitol building a couple of weeks ago? Well, I mean, I can add my eyewitness testimony to it. And I think what we're getting right now is a lot of spin from partisan actors who want to exploit the events to achieve different outcomes. Um, I witnessed a chaotic riot Bit, the pro-Trump fanatic and military veteran had just been shot in the neck by a Capitol police officer and I was storming out of the Capitol. They were being pushed out because uh, that shooting, that single bullet reversed the mob's onslaught. And so it was a chaotic, very confusing situation. I saw people with her blood on their hands, people screaming a girl had been shot uh, I saw other people actually tried to justify it because these pro-Trump leaders are so accustomed to this masochistic worship of police and security forces and anyone in a uniform, and then arguments ensued. Um, and you know, on the other side of the Capitol, there were tens of thousands of people who were just having a, the time of their life, basically 
rampaging up and across the national mall. And by the time I got to that side, after interviewing lots of people on the back end of the Capitol steps, um, you know, tear gas was raining down. I found two cops who were basically being held hostage in the Capitol basement. They couldn't get out because they didn't want to walk. Some members of the crowd were trying to negotiate their release. And then the tear gas intensified uh, around five o'clock, flashbang flying everywhere. Some sectors of the crowd were just impervious to the tear gas and pushed back. And by about seven o'clock, Congress was back in session and the crowd was completely dispersed. Um, there were the hardcore members who rioted inside the Capitol and they clearly had no plan, no idea of what they were going to do once they got in there. But there was a sector of that mob that was trying to get into the speaker's lobby where Ashley Babbitt was shot. And it's, I don't know what their intentions were, but they were on a violent rampage. And what was most striking to me about the entire scene was the complete Capitol police officers. I didn't see any police officers except for a few trying to pepper spray people to get them out of the Capitol, but on the Capitol grounds. And it was only about, I mean, this began in the morning and then the crowd store in the very early afternoon. And it took about four hours for riot police to arrive. And they were hectored by the crowd called Chinese communist agents, um, just screamed at in ways that I could never imagine talking to a police officer without getting a baton in the face. And uh, they were not in riot gear initially that they had Black Lives Matter protests. So that's really the question is why the police stand and We've witnessed a complete militarization of the city to the point where the stand down has been almost forgotten. And we have celebrities coming to the city for the inauguration. Uh, Jill Biden was out today, the first lady, to celebrate this military presence. The people of this city are not celebrating, and it's supposed to be here to keep us safe. But it's pretty obvious to me this is a public relations exercise by the Pentagon, which stood down on January 6th. I was going to ask you the, uh, to, to say more about that. You, you, this is what you wrote. Uh, just a reminder, you're a resident of D.C., and, and this is what you wrote. At, D, at D.C.'s hyper-militarized red zone, I spoke to local residents, about 28,000 troops in D.C., most were uneasy about the show of force, wondered where all the troops were on January the 6th. Uh, so this unintended or maybe intended consequence, right? This hyper-militarization, on the one hand, need for security, right? On the other hand, this hyper-militarization. Talk to us about the balance. Talk to us about what you're hearing and seeing in your analysis. Well, these, the, the storming of the Capitol was planned in the open days ahead of January 6th. So I can't imagine the F about it. On January 4th, Muriel Bowser, the mayor of DC, requested uh, something like 300 National Guard troops positioned at areas actually well away from the Capitol, kind of at strategic points. It took 90 minutes for the Pentagon to authorize after a long call with all these, getting all these principles on the, a, a, a National Guard dispatch, they chose to send them in minivans rather than armored vehicles. And I know there was discomfort among local leadership about having a military presence in the streets because of what happened last June when the military straight up attacked a Black Lives Matter protest. I was present there. I think we might've talked about it yeah. um, here. And so there are so many questions that I have about why they downplayed this obvious threat. Then after the complete security failure, when the Capitol was stormed, the FBI begins stating that they're hearing chatter and all of these plans are being made to attack state capitals across the country and Washington, DC, and the troops arrive. And it's not just an adequate deployment to stop uh, uh, a, a you know right wing protest that 
Uh, I think 6,000 troops were brought into the city last summer for Black Lives Matter. And there were far more protesters than there were at Stop the Steal. Um, I mean, a large part of the city participated in those protests. So not 6,000, which was already too much. They bring out 28,000, which is more than the number of U.S. troops stationed in South Korea which is kind of like under de facto U.S. military occupation to maintain a demilitarized zone and divide the country from itself. It's more troops than in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan combined. And they establish a green zone and a red zone in the heart of the city, spanning from the south, of Capitol Hill, Eastern Market, through the National Mall area, all the way to downtown D.C. towards the White House area. The green zone prevents vehicles from going through and it's blocked off by police cars and trucks and buses. And just, you know, it feels like the city is under some kind of blockade. And then once you, if you, if you walk into the green zone, pedestrian traffic's allowed, local residents have to go in and out and businesses are still somewhat open. Then you get to the red zone and there are these 12 foot fences, which went up instantly. It was sort of impressive and disturbing that these fences went up so fast around all of the areas where the inauguration took place around the Capitol and behind them and around this entire area are thousands of troops who are just sitting around doing nothing. Thousands of troops actually were kicked off the Capitol grounds because they were told they weren't needed two days ago, which shows how superfluous they were and how overblown the whole thing was. And then they were stuck in parking lots, treated like human rubbish. It's now a scandal on top of which is being ignored. But what we've seen is a force by the military against the American public, and it's still there. I don't know why they're not leaving. The mayor, Bowser, has said this is the new normal. But I, I mean, we can clearly see a complete deterioration of American society unfolding before our eyes, directed against Ameri Americans are being called out as the new terror threat on par with Al Qaeda and ISIS. Um, two organizations which exist in large part due to American meddling in the Middle East. Uh, and the normalization of this police, pre this, this military presence is something that's especially disturbing to me to see celebrity chefs like Jose Andres and Spike Mendelson go run around feeding them in this giant publicity stunt when they already have food that we, the taxpayers pay for uh, and thank them for keeping us safe when that's not what's taking place it needs to be rejected because we need to reject militarization. We need to reject the Pentagon's $800 billion budget the same way we reject of police budgets. And so the outcome of this whole event, which is said to be protecting us from fascism, is that the next time there is a legislative push for police demilitarization or a grassroots push for defunding the police, or an anti-war push for reducing the Pentagon budget. They'll come back and say, we protected you from fascism. That's what we're here for. And, we, and the FBI will say, we need this huge surveillance apparatus to protect you from white supremacists. And so it's really important for people who are progressive minded to not fall into this rhetorical and political trap of what's taking place here. I have a I've kind of a convoluted question. I think you'll be able to make sense of it. Let me let me just ramble for just a second, and then I'd, I'd like yeah. to your reflections. You're someone who analyzes and writes commentaries on human behavior. Um, uh, I, I want to ask you about the, the 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 intersection between conspiracy theories and authoritarianism. A number of us here have been talking about and reading about authoritarianism. So QAnon, end time scenarios on the right and the left. And then you add into that mix more racist ethno-nationalist elements, the Boogaloos and Proud Boys and neo-Nazis. Talk to us a little bit about, uh, I mean, what, what gives rise to such views and 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 
and the way that these these various groups give themselves over to uh, uh, authoritarian uh, uh, leaders. Well, when a system collapses or when the individual is unable to cope with change, rapid change and modernity, they often look for a transcendent leader or political movement to deliver them from the anguish, the psychological anguish, and often the, the economic and the anguish and material conditions that they're facing. Um, in this case, it has a lot to do, when you look at QAnon, it has a lot to do with confusion, psychological. The result of the deliberate de-education of the American public through the defunding of its education system and the focus on standardized testing and lack of critical thinking. So when people on the right uh, drift into an kind of right-wing authoritarianism, either a personal crisis, a communal crisis. Um, this is something very typical in a hyper-capitalist society like ours. We shouldn't be surprised this is happening. And they develop what the psychologist Eric Fromm, who I think wrote the seminal book on right-wing authoritarianism, Escape from Freedom, called yeah. sadomasochism. It's not the kind of sadomasochism where they want to go in a dungeon, although many of them probably possibly do but it's a kind of sadomasochism where you are simultaneously and that you bow down to this mythical leader who could be the kind of like macho Jesus uh, of the book of revelations, you know, Fabio of Nazareth, who's kind of like sword <laughs> that he kills your enemies with, or it could be Donald Trump. Donald Trump is really a mythical leader who follow QAnon who are being told through Q drop and another um, you know, far corners of the internet that Donald Trump is rescuing a cabal of elite pedophiles. And when a figure like Jeffrey Epstein emerges, well, then it all starts to kind of make sense because he actually was running a kind of pedophile ring for elites. So then they're sadistic at the same time. They feel this need for, for vengeance. There's all this pent up anger and they want to lash out at people, reflect the former self that they that haunted them from the time that they experienced this crisis, or uh, reflects something outside themselves that they see as beneath them, and that confers on them a certain status. So that could be the poor, black people, uh, or. Chinese communists have become a really popular enemy that's provided ideological coherence for the pro-Trump base. And so what I noticed, I mean, I've covered this phenomenon for years, but what I noticed just being at the Stop the Steal rally and being around this particular element, which it does include parts of the Christian right, but being around the more QAnon conspiracy minded people is that they believe they have actual knowledge of events that others don't understand. And when they go to events like Stop the Steal, they meet other people who have that same special knowledge and who have those same trigger points, you know, pedophiles, Epstein, Chinese communist, and they don't know the person and the person could be from, live somewhere thousands of miles away from them. But when they, all these other people, same worldview, they developed uh, separately, but through the same kind of, dark corners of the internet that confirms the reality of the conspiracy for them. And then they become a cult. And I witnessed many people talking and saying, I never met this guy before, but he's like I do. And so there is a, there, there's a cult gathered around a mythical leader like Trump, a mythical figure like Trump that despises and has been, has anti-establishment tendencies, but has been led into a political cul-de-sac, the, the, this conspiratorial thinking. And it actually, in the end, winds up reinforced very authoritarian establishment and provides them with the basis for social media suppression, you know, getting rid of all of these uh, social media accounts that challenge establishment views in conspiratorial ways. And then going even further than that, there's talk of a new Patriot Act, domestic Patriot Act. 
So I think this phenomenon has come to a head. It's been with us for a very long time. And many of you who are older than me will probably know it, be more familiar with it on an intimate level than I am from, you know, the 1970s and 1960s, uh, the McCarthy era with this uh, whole conspiracy about communists penetrating the Eisenhower. It's all coming back and come, it's all risen to the surface and Trump is not going away. He, it, he's not going away and he's a singular figure in the Republican party. He's transcended the, he's transcended the bipartisan divide, the partisan divide and he's this vast movement at his disposal. And that's why he's talking about running again. I mean, remember when George W. Bush left office, he was a hated figure in the Republican party. Trump is still beloved by millions of Americans and the Republican party is scared of him. Mitch McConnell's afraid of him. And that's why I think there's this drive to impeach him because it's the only way to prevent him from running again and wreaking havoc on a very decayed political system. I wanted to follow, follow up uh, um, uh, with what you said, but let me take just a little uh, uh, detour. You mentioned about uh, the various uh, social media platforms, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and uh, others. Uh, who've been kind of the, uh, the you know cast as the the the, the evil vehicles for uh, um, these conspiracy theories, and there's all kinds of moves now to to uh, regulate them at best. Talk to us about your views about uh, the various social media platforms, and I mentioned the more benign ones. I'm not even sure I know much about uh, these other platforms like Parler and, and other platforms where these conspiracy theories are really being shared, you know, among the, their members. Well, I just don't see any scenario in the, you know, mainstream social media platforms and the establishment voices on tell people you don't like the rules here and you want to continue spreading your conspiracy theories, go start another alternative social media platform. And then the web hosting service for that platform, I'm referring to Parler, removes it from existence. Those people who participated in that platform may become disassociated from one another for the time being, but it only increases their sense of victimhood and resentment uh, and they'll find another place to worldview oh, to get. Um, yeah, I, I just don't see another a scenario in which um, social media censorship doesn't begin engulfing those of us who are on the left, who are in the anti-war movement, and who are crusading against the establishment in a fact-based way. Uh, it already has targeted uh, targeted us through various means at the gray zone, and so I can't. I can't support it. And I already see a number of YouTube accounts being taken, like disappeared for dubious reasons, which are left with, oh, it's targeting the right, but I can see it sweeping up the left as well. And I think what we're witnessing with the Biden administration, when we hear Biden talk about unity, a lot of people miss this term unity, which he used nine times in his inaugural address as meaning left-right collaboration. Of course, Biden will cooperate with all the, you know, um, corporate Republicans that he worked with for decades. I mean, that's a given, but what he's not, he's not talking about like welcoming Trump voters and trying to lay down arms with them. What he means is a unity among transatlantic elites kind of neoliberal establishment, a, a salvaging and consolidation of the neoliberal establishment against all challenges from the left and right. And right now, right is presenting a much more, more coherent and serious challenge to the centrist establishment, whereas large sectors of the left have been co-opted by the party and still deem that a few progressive members of Congress can deliver serious change. So they're presenting much of a threat. So that relates to the kind of social media censorship we're going to see. And it's not going to, it didn't start with Trump and it definitely 
won't end there. But what I can say is that a society that feels the need to censor its own president lacks completely lacks self. Let me, uh, uh, I want, I want to ask you a personal question, Max. Uh, you in the gray zone have been unafraid to gore the sacred ox, right? Uh, in fact, multiple sacred oxen uh, uh, with your reporting, Republican, Democrat, left, right, domestic policy, foreign policy, and more. The gray zone describes itself as, quote, investigative journalism on empire. What, what, what is it that moves you? Uh, what makes Max tick? Talk, talk about this neoliberal empire on the right and left that you're investigating and what, what moves you to do what you do? Well, I guess that, that's a hard question to answer, but when I see not just injustice, nothing being done about it and a complete acceptance of it, especially within our political system, it moves me as a journalist to want to expose what's happening. And we've never seen so much consensus among our media, including self-described progressive media for the imperial designs of this country. Now we're in an era where the US isn't going to just declare that a country has some secret weapons capacity and then send hundreds and hundreds of tanks and fight a conventional war about the ruler and have them basically lynched. That's not what's gonna happen. Although it could happen and has happened recently, it did happen in Libya, but we're, we're in an era of hybrid warfare where the US just selects targets on the map that get in the way of the, the financial capital, the oligarchy that the US represents and this begins destroying them through more sophisticated means, sanctions, information warfare, lawfare. And the American public itself becomes a target through the information war that's waged by the media, where that target has to be demonized to the point where of part of the public, which normally serves as a barrier to these kinds of regime change wars that have destroyed large swaths of the globe, begin to support it on the grounds that, well, the dictator committing human rights crimes and we have to save people. So it's obviously this, the media campaign contains so much falsehoods that are easy for us to expose if we're willing to do it and willing to do the hard going to the ground in those countries and seeing what's going on or being here in Washington and challenging officials to their faces in think tanks and in Congress. That's what we've done. And, and, and yeah, the response has been harsh it does feel like goring a sacred ox, but it's also been very rewarding from uh, an American public and, and an international public that knows that something's very wrong, uh, often is on the other side of the and rewards us for the work we're doing. So, I mean, it's been a very rewarding experience, although we get, we, we receive an enormous amount of attacks. I mean, no one is really come at us and pointed out some serious, substantial, factual errors on the site or journalistic malpractice, the kind we see in mainstream media on a regular basis. Yet Wikipedia, which is said to be this people's encyclopedia has listed us as a deprivation uh, because a number of neoconservative users just waged a campaign basically to, dis to make it impossible to cite the gray zone as a legitimate source. And that makes it so hard to update uh, entries relating to the Syrian proxy war, for example, with all the work we've done on that, because in many cases, we're one of the only sites that has done certain work in areas that upends the official story. So that became a story for us as well, covering how the gray zone in public and, and how the, the perception of it is manipulated. Um, and so what motivates me just uh, it, 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 it all goes, it can all go back to Palestine, which was, I think at one time, a sacred ox or sacred cow, Watch that in Washington. If you're Jewish, like I am, you talk about Palestine as 
a society that has been ethnized by an apartheid state, then you are a pariah. You are a self-hating Jew. That was the years ago. I don't feel that to be the case anymore. I think there is of a mainstream liberal acceptance of the fact that Israel is an apartheid state. Uh, we see that reflected in the recent report by Beth Selim, which is a mainstream list human rights group in Israel, which has done really important work. But they, I mean, they went with the apartheid desk after years and years of holding back and holding out hope for a two-state solution. This has a lot to do with Netanyahu being in power, dominance of Israel, uh, the true legacy of Sheldon Adelson in the United States and the Israel lobby. And I think, you know, large sectors of the political establishment in Washington have had it, although they won't do anything. So I thought it was, it's important to, to, to keep Palestine a placeholder and use Palestine as a prism for seeing the rest of the world and, and, and Israel as well. I always Israel is not uniquely evil. Israel reflection of the most severe image of the Western world and its history of settler colonialism, colonialism, and uh, per, you know the, the state of per. and so I, through working on power, being there, I was able to see my own society and my own government in a much clearer way. And that's how I continue to see everything we do at the gray zone. I'm glad you brought up uh, Israel and Palestine. Thank you for that answer. And uh, uh, I appreciate uh, your kind of uh, internal reflections very much. I'm glad you brought up Palestine and Israel. This Beth Selim report really rocked uh, 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 Israeli society as well as us in the activist community because this is an Israeli human rights organization. Uh, yet uh, um, um, NPR, when they reported on it, and this is, you know, even NPR, which most of us progressives, you know, kind of look to as something that, that at least should, should be something that would be helpful for us to view. Um, Matt Duss, who's Bernie Sanders' foreign policy advisor, former director of uh, Foundation for Middle East Peace, criticized NPR for their reporting on Betselem's report because no Palestinian viewpoint was mentioned as NPR reported on uh, uh, Betselem. In fact, this is what Matt tweeted. He said, imagine a report on South African apartheid that didn't bother talking to black people. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Beth Selim's report. One other thing, and then I'll let you respond. Um, Tony Blinken, <laughs> I, I, don't, I shouldn't have to say much more, but let me just say a few more words for, the, for those of us on the call. President Biden's nominee for Secretary of State. I was just asked in one of the hearings by Ted Cruz, do you agree that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel? And do you commit that the United States will keep our embassy in Jerusalem? Yes and yes. And then the latest headline in Mondo Weiss was Biden's Secretary of State praises Trump's achievements on Israel. Talk to us about, uh, I mean, and we know that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have been absolutist in their careers in support of Israel. Talk to us about the Biden-Harris Middle East policy. I know you've been critical of it, as well as their policy on Israel, as well as on Iran, too. I've given you a kind of a wide open question, but talk to us a little bit about the Biden, Biden and Harris in the Middle East. Yeah, great questions. <clears throat> Just first on, on Beth Selim, what also makes it remarkable that they made this, issued this report on apartheid is that they've been funded by the New Israel Fund, which is a liberal Zionist entity that um, doles out funding to all sorts of human rights groups on the condition that they do not support BDS. And many of its funders oppose the BDS movement and really oppose Palestine solidarity in its truest. Selim is just 
laid the groundwork for the support of BDS among uh, much more established NGOs by designating Israel as an apartheid state. It is apartheid is a crime under international law. So the most legitimate response would be be. So this is this is landmark language, and uh, while it's important that we are which I call national propaganda radio, it's just a nonstop uh, mighty Wurlitzer for U.S. intelligence, U.S. empire. Uh, while you know it's important that they include Palestinian, voice, depends on who those Palestinians are. Uh, it's a representational politics can be very dangerous because when you demand that a newspaper simply have a Muslim columnist or a black columnist, they'll select someone who's just simply says the same things that the liberal or conservative columnists say, but in black or brown face. And we see that phenomenon constant times or at CNN with the kind of contributors and columnists that they, that they welcome in while include actual black socialists or figures like Glenn Ford, anyone who writes for the Black Agenda Report would never be welcomed in any mainstream media. And they represent a real constituency. So back, so to, to your question about Tony Blink, an interesting character, um, information hearing was absolutely pathetic. He, to every question, he was a hard line, neoconservative like Lindsey Graham, he would respond according to the sensibilities of the senator. Lindsey Graham was practically having an orgasm by the time his questioning of Blinken ended. I mean, he asked them, do you consider Iran the worst terrorist threat in the world? Not ISIS, you know, any of the organizations that actually wage campaigns of international terror, but Iran. And he said, just immediately he says yes. Then he said yes to Ted Cruz's question. Clearly he wants them to but the, um, his testimony will, painted a picture of a secretary of state who could have served under the second Bush administration and not the first Bush administration. And it shows you how Donald Trump and the Republican Party have shifted Overton window of foreign policy so far to the right administration coming in sees all of these moves that Pompeo made as leverage against country to extract concessions, if not outright, and wants to do the Palestinian question altogether, as you pointed out, Michael. Biden, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, these figures have been absolute, uh, absolutely unlocked the lobby for their whole careers. Joe Biden, appeared at Ariel Sharon's funeral and praised him as the bulldozer, the man who destroyed Janine refugee, Janine camp with bulldozers. Biden referred to him fondly as the bulldozer. Biden stated once in the Senate that if Israel did not exist, the U.S. would have to create it. And Kamala Harris has been one of the most loyal uh, servants Back, appearing at its conference, meeting privately with Netanyahu after receiving criticism. So it's this administration will want to do away with the Palestinian question in a much more cohesive way. It has Dennis Ross in its inner circle, uh, the, Israel's lawyer, who was one of the played Israel's lawyer during negotiations. And he said that we don't see any reason for bringing up this. So and and then we have to consider the fact that Tony Blinken's father, sorry, stepfather, Samuel Pisar, was buried at a de facto state funeral in Jerusalem with members of government in attendance. His father was a major figure in the French Israel lobby. He was very close to the Israeli government as well as uh, he was kind of a fixer for France former French prime minister. He was a very powerful figure and, 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 and diplomat. Um, and one interesting, well, there are two interesting things about Blinken's father I should bring up first. And I don't know how this relates to anything. It just kind of fascinates me. He was, a, he was like a consigliere for Robert Maxwell, who was a Mossad agent uh, and British elite who died mysteriously on a yacht 
and he fell off a, a yacht under, under very mysterious circumstances. The last spoke to was Blinken's stepfather, Pissar, the father of Jillian Maxwell, right. who is Jeffrey Epstein's yeah. partner, literal partner in crime. All their and the other, it, yeah, the other fascinating star is that uh, he was a survivor. Dude. And Tony Blinken, when he was confirmed, when he was introduced as Biden's nominee for Secretary of State, gave this speech and made this comment again and again in all his public appearances about how his father, who was not an American at the time, his stepfather, um, was rescued from Auschwitz by a black soldier in a tank. And the only words he knew were, God bless America, said to the soldier. But if you actually read interviews with Samuel P. So that I credit the U.S. and Red Army with saving me. It was the Red Army that fought the hardest to uh, defeat Nazi Germany. And I'm forever indebted to the Soviet Union and the Red Army. And Blinken, I mean, this is he's, he has to adopt the anti-Russian policy. So he got that history out of and Russian cooperation that saved his father's life. And I think that's significant. Let me, uh, uh, we have a question from our friend Hin Corey uh, about how the Palestinians, do you have any, do you have any suggestions for the Palestinian response to uh, a President Biden and uh, Secretary of State Blinken and their policies regarding the Palestinians? Well, it really relates to the Palestinian Authority and the this dictatorial regime that is the main instrument of U.S. control and Israeli control over Palestinians as its subcontractor and how the Palestinian Authority continues to persist despite there being no peace process, no interest among the Palestinian diaspora or refugees. Palestinian National Council elections. I mean, obviously no one cares about legislative council elections, but this entity is the, one of the main obstacles to progress for Palestinians. But of course, you no, know, if it disappears, there could be chaos and more ethnic cleansing. But the apparatus that was put into place during the Bush administration through Keith Dayton is one of um, repression and also separating Palestinians in the West Bank from those in Gaza who are living under the rule of Hamas. And that needs to be answered before, I mean, it needs to be seen as the hand of Biden who will fund the PA. I mean, there's going to be more funding for the PA. They'll start funding UNRWA again, which, you know, through the work of Jared Kushner, an Israel lobbyist and was Trump's son-in-law. UNRWA was defunded. They'll put those mechanisms back in place, but they will continue to Palestinian question from history. And I think it needs to be on the PA. I've got two or three or four more questions we want to get in in the next 10 or 15 minutes, Max. So uh, uh, let, let's do our best to, I'm going to, you know, All kind right. of fire no everything is great but let uh let, let me ask you about um something that's near and dear to your heart and that is venezuela uh i i want to give you a chance to say a word about that for for most of us that's not on our radar screen uh, uh i know that in addition to all the celebrities uh you, you made mention in one of your uh in one of your reports at, on the gray zone that among the foreign dignitaries was Carlos Vecchio, a former Exxon lawyer who right. currently was as kind of the interim president's envoy to Washington. Uh, Venezuela is close. It's near and dear to your heart. Talk to us about Venezuela and why we should be caring about Venezuela, we who are activists here in the U.S. Great question. Uh, I just put up I just published an interview with Venezuela's vice president, Delcy Rodriguez at the gray zone, the gray zone.com that might be interesting to people about the measures Venezuela is undertaking because of this crushing us blockade that was imposed. 
Uh, Venezuela has been the engine for progress and continental integration and decolonization uh, since its Bolivarian revolution in 1998, which was a democratic revolution led by Hugo Chavez. And it sits on the world's largest oil reserves. It also has enormous reserves of minerals and poses a gigantic threat to US empire. It helped save Cuba from the special period it was under, which was where there were terrible conditions. It helped allow other socialist or democratic socialist governments to flourish from sent to across the South American continent. It even provided heating oil for free or at very low prices to impoverished communities in the United States. And that was Venezuela at its high point in 2014, 2013, the Obama administration initiated an economic war. Um, oil prices plunged, sanctions were imposed on Venezuela, and the goal was to prevent it from being able to have revenue, to have assets. And that meant that all of the anti-poverty programs, everything that was done to wipe, to reduce extreme poverty by 50% and to support progressive governments across the Western hemisphere, was uh, reversed because the state oil company, PDVSA, which through its sales financed all of these social programs, uh, was being starved of revenue. That includes a program to majority of Venezuelans. Uh, the U.S. has put sanctions on a program to feed Venezuelans. It's a program called CLAP. And, uh, two weeks or every month, Venezuelans get a box of sanitary supplies and foodstuffs that are really important to their diet, and the U.S. is seeking to prevent that program from existing while supporting these arsonist leaders like Carlos Vecchio, who you mentioned, who's the Guaido's ambassador in D.C., was invited to Biden's inauguration, and he's wanted for activities that were very similar to what we saw at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, where he helped lead a march to the Venezuelan public prosecutor's office, which was then torched, which was set on fire. Um, they've done this for years. So Venezuela is such an important country if you believe in fighting neocolonialism or imperialism, and you just simply care about people who are our neighbors, hemisphere, who are being literally killed through a crushing U.S. blockade, which aims to prevent Venezuela from simply having an economy I mean, we know about, I'm sure all of you on this call know about the siege of Gaza. Well, this is something to what the U.S. is doing to Venezuela uh, in order to shift its government back to the kind that it had before, which was a neoliberal government that served a tiny oligarchy and left the rest of the population in misery. That's why I care about it. And, you know, having traveled there, my first trip to Fort Wayne, I came straight from Venezuela, having traveled there and seen the reality. It's very moving. I want you to say a word about uh, uh, the Julian Assange case, Edward Snowden. Um, there are all kinds of levels, uh, not least of which is the relationship between the governments of the UK and the US. Our previous uh, president considered truth and science tools to manipulate at best and enemies of the state uh, at worst. If I read you correctly, you were hoping he would pardon Snowden and Assange. Talk about these truth tellers as uh, Cornel, Cornel West calls them, laying bare the crimes of American empire. What needs to happen now under this new administration? Well, yeah, I thought that Trump would be the president to pardon. He had spoken favorably of him. People around Trump were supporting Assange's pardon, even crazy Rudy Giuliani. Uh, you had Tucker Carlson, who's the host of Trump's favorite show, lobbying for Assange's freedom every night and hosting even left-wing voices uh, to campaign for his freedom. And Trump, basically, he pardoned a bunch of his buddies and showed how in the end, he actually, despite his anti-establishment presentation, wound up servicing the agenda of the national security establishment in ways that they would have never imagined back in 2017. It was a pathetic surrender. Uh, on Snowden as well, who's free but must be confined to 
Russia, a country he's not from. But w- what's important here, I mean, it's very basic. Assange was a publisher. He was a journalist. What he did was publish classified information, which was a, a, a huge service to the, to the public. It changed history. It allowed us to see all of these classified State Department cables, stations around the world. It wasn't limited to the U.S. It's published classified information on Russia's intelligence services, on Stratfor, which operates as a kind of private spying firm. And at the gray zone, we've benefited so much from it. But he did nothing beyond journalism and publishing, established partnerships with papers, including the New York Times and the Washington Post, and has been hold, had been holed up in an embassy, the Ecuadorian embassy in London for years, where he was being spied on by the CIA. I even revealed at the gray zone uh, through court documents, uh, uh, where that contractor that was spying on him is on trial and some court documents that showed private communications where this CIA contractor was plotting to poison Assange in the embassy. This should have been a major scandal. And he was arrested. He's been jailed at a maximum security prison, Belmarsh in London, uh, which is infested with covid the judge in London ruled that he won't be extradited to the U.S., so he's basically just holed up without any conviction in a maximum security prison for the crime of journalism. He's charged with eight violating the Espionage Act for publishing classified information, and he would have faced 175 years in U.S. prison. So what does that mean for the rest of us who want to publish classified information, have always done in supposedly democratic societies. It means everyone's a target. And the New York Times and Washington Post, which celebrated Julian Assange's arrest through their editorial boards, have been forced to admit that they cannot support his conviction because it means that they could be in the crosshairs as well. So the, this, is a, this is the seminal case for free speech, for a free press, for the first, for, for, our constitution, but for the freedom of us to know, because as Julian Assange said, if wars can be started with lies, they can be stopped with the truth. Let me, uh, uh, we've got a couple questions from friends on uh, the chat, in the chat room Uh, from a friend here in Fort Wayne, Jerry Lawson. Could you comment on media reports about Chinese incarceration of minorities in the West? Well, I can, con- I, I mean, we only have a little bit of time and I think this requires more time. Read what we have uh, reported on that at the gray zone and which has earned us attacks from state outlets. Uh, the Trump State Department initiated an attack on us for poking major holes in their campaign, which culminated with Pompeo's 11th hour designation of China's policies in the Western Xinjiang region as genocide. And we've looked at the sources of and revealed them to be shoddy, suspect, supported by US government interests, even financial interests. And uh, I think there is, there, there, there could be criticism of Chinese repressive, of repressive Chinese policies but what I, what, what's becoming clear to me and to many people, including many who self-censor and are afraid to say it, is this is another R2P style, that's responsibility to protect style, humanitarian intervention, which is using human rights propaganda to amp world war with China and oppose, impose economic sanctions and, uh, I could get into a lot of detail, but under the fact that the two main sources for all of them, literally all of them are Adrian Zentz, a far right evangelical Christian who has said that he is on a mission from God against the Chinese communist party and the Australian strategic and policy strategy and policy Institute, sorry, security and policy Institute, which is State Department, the Australian Ministry of Defense, and the arms industry. Very clear, very clear interest in ramping up the new Cold War 
And it wouldn't be the first time that an, a my China was used to increase tensions. Uh, the Tibetan group of the Dalai Lama was supported by the CIA for decades in order to balkanize China. The leaders of the Hong Kong protest supported by the US State Department and have all you know, been basically revealed to be right-wing Trump supporters to the embarrassment of a lot of their progressive supporters in the US. So it's important to keep in mind when you're talking about Chinese policies that uh, there might be an agenda there and that we also use slave labor here in the United States to make many products like prison labor uh, and gets very little attention for whatever reason. Let me uh, it's much less attention than we hear than than alleged forced labor in Western China. One question, then I'm going to make some announcements, and I'll come back to you for some parting words. Um, our friend Don Wagner um, asks, uh, and then I'm going to add. A short little question to his. We have a number, we have a few new members of the House of uh, Representatives plus AOC and others. What could they realistically do to revive a legitimate agenda for decolonizing Palestine given Biden, Blinken, and the hierarchy as committed Zionists? We need to see funding restored but not turn the Palestinians into a humanitarian project. It needs a political solution. So that's Don's question. I'm going to add to that and talk to us about we who are in the activist community uh, about our strategy now under a new administration. And 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 let me just <laughs> uh, uh, add to that. You know, we're all we're all grateful that the previous occupant of the White House is gone. Uh, how do how do progressives hold President Biden's feet to the fire without empowering the religious and political right that's still very present and powerful and already planting seeds for power right in 2022 and 24. So that I, I'm trying to mix it all together. How do we how are we activists now in Palestine, Israel, and these other progressive causes without empowering the right, you know? Well, I would look to Don for an answer before I would offer one myself, I mean, who's been on the front lines of this uh, struggle for decades. And, you know, I think we've seen members of Congress come and go. We've seen resolutions issued, change in Congress. Uh, the squad definitely offers a different um, culturally diverse look at political prog or, or version of political progressivism that includes a Palestinian member, Rashida Tlaib. And she has been willing to s state even recently that Israel's conducting medical apartheid by giving vaccines to Jewish Israelis and citizens of Israel, but not to the Palestinians. It occupies vaccines for COVID. She has called Israel an apartheid state, order of BDS. And the rest of the, they hold progressive in Palestine. What's important to do is to push BDS related resolutions, it, not resolutions, BDS related measures to hold Israel accountable for the crime of apartheid and to consistently use the word apartheid. Regardless of how much pressure that's face nationally, because they have, you know, all these swing districts where the religious right is powerful. And if you're in Congress and you're a progressive, you get pressured by Pelosi and the leadership to tone down your rhetoric in order for them to win those elections. And so I think you have to choose to prioritize Palestine over, uh, you know, political efficacy and opportunism. And there was a huge opportunity, I thought, for the squad to take a stand for Palestine by not supporting Nancy Pelosi, one of the worst enemies of Palestine in Congress. They also had an opportunity to force 
a vote on Medicare for all by withholding their votes for Pelosi. She needed them to be House Speaker. And they chose not to exercise that. And then days later, there was the attack on the Capitol by far right mobs campaign of pressure, which AOC had actually called violence. And this was just like a campaign playing out on Twitter. She called it violence. It was kind of swept away in all of the shock and horror about what happened at the Capitol. And we haven't heard about it since. Um, I think it's up to, to put pressure on the AOCs of Congress to, to accept that they are going to, that they are going to take up the banner of Palestine. Um, there might've been another question there, but I, I, I kind of got lost. No, that's okay. Um, so in terms of our, uh, our activism, um, um, this kind of pressure that you're talking about, um, even in conservative districts. So you're not looking for an incremental approach at all, are you? Well, I've seen an incremental approach throughout my life. I'm 43 now. I kind of lose track of how old I am. Um, maybe, maybe some of you know the feeling, um, but I haven't seen any material change in my life um, except that produced by the Republicans, which has been social services and just erode the public sector. And, you know, I've about had it with the Democratic Party. Um, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where else to go, but there has to be a movement built outside the party, including on a local level, exercise pressure and actually start pushing for real material change. It's the kind of material change that's needed to offset the power of a religious right that exploits the fact government has shipped away jobs, has brought in the opioid crisis into Rust Belt and middle American communities, has uh, whittled away at welfare and left people with nowhere to go but the evangelical and Pentecostal church and left people with the prospect. So there has to be something done and it's not going to be done uh, by, uh, you know, charity or by Bill Gates or through te technocratic solutions. So Don's right. It, we, we have to keep pressure on to make a political solution. When I think the, I would say up front, I'm very encouraged. At least what I can say is that we've won the argument. We've won the argument in the U S and the progressive demographic no longer includes liberal Zionist figures who are willing to, who, who, are, who are able to get in the way and sabotage campaigns or um, the way that Goliath, which came out in 2013, faced all these attacks, not just from right-wing Zionists, but from liberal Zionists. That is uh, an aspect of the past that we don't have to deal with anymore. So I think a lot of the hard work is beginning to pay off, but we haven't seen any material in place to withhold US aid to Israel. And it's pretty clear to me, once those spare parts refuse to come for the F-15s and F-16s, Israel is gonna be reeling. I mean, it doesn't, it won't take a lot. Uh, their occupation is resting on a house of cards although it might appear to be this uh, impervious Goliath. And I also want to point out that Israel has attacked Syria, killed four Syrian civilians yesterday. Israel has attacked Syria hundreds of times. It has attacked Syria scores of times this year. Almost every day it is attacking Syria. And the Palestine Solidarity Movement needs to take a stand on this issue and on the brutal Caesar sanctions that the U.S., has imposed on Syria a number of Christian churches, uh, Christian leaders and churches across the world are beginning to speak. And these are like the sanctions imposed on Iraq in the 90s that destroyed Iraq's infrastructure. It's hot and led to mass death among the young Iraqis and it's already happening in Syria. So it's about this as well. Uh, and why do I do what we do at the gray zone? Back to that question. 
because so few are speaking up about this. We have an interview with Alina Duhan, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on sanctions. And she has inter- did, we have an interview on our site with her and she calls this an attack on civilian life in Syria. And we are one of the few sites in the Western world to interview this expert on sanctions. The rest of the US media won't touch this massive human rights crime. The human rights industry, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, they won't talk about this. Why? Because they lobbied for these sanctions. They pushed for it. So it's up to us. And you know, I want to I want to bring that message to you as well. Uh, so, uh, Max, uh, um, thanks for joining us today. Do you have any parting words for us? No, I just uh, want to thank everyone for showing up and for all the work you're doing. And uh, again, reissue my hope that we can get together in person someday. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Uh, we're hoping for that too, Max. We're hoping for that very much. And next time we'll uh, we'll uh, get you to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, Syria, the corporate media, uh, the Black Lives Movement. I have a whole list of questions here that we weren't able to get to today, but we'll get to them next time. Okay. So uh, yeah, sorry uh, if I went if I went too long, but no, I'll no, always be available. No, it's important, and what you had to share with us is important. So Max Blumenthal, thank you. uh, And thank you all for joining us today. 